Hello, everybody. Uh, hi. Hi. Oh, there's my hand. Hi. Um, it, enjoy my tablecloth because uh, this is kind of <laughs> weird video. Um, I have... This is the funniest thing. I have a giant zit on my face, so I will not be on camera because I'm not going to subject anybody to that. I am so sorry. But I still wanted to do a video. It's probably going to be a shorter one. Uh, I am continuing my series on the bestsellers of such and such a year. I am up to the bestseller of 1897, My Goodness How Time Flies. What was the bestseller of 1897? Well, according to Publishers Weekly, which, again, that's a list I'm going off of. I'm sure there's contradictory uh, lists out there, but that's the oldest one I could find, so that's the one we're doing. According to Publishers Weekly, the bestseller of 1897 was... Quo Vadis. I'm switching where I'm filming here because there was an awful glare from the overhead light. Quo Vadis! Da, 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 da. Hello! Quo Vadis by Henrik Sinkiewicz. I may be saying that wrong. Uh, probably am. This is an interesting edition. It is old. It is classic. It is original. It is over 500 pages. It is 512 pages, and that's why it's taken me so long <laughs> to get another video in this series out. It took me a long time to read it, even though, even though it is a good book. It is an engrossing read. This is a very nice edition that I got off of eBay. It's very pretty. It's got some lovely small print. I'll show you that. The cover is beautiful, and it has a picture of a lady on it. I'm not sure why. Um, there is a young lady who is the heroine of the novel, and she's described decently like this lady on the cover, only she has blue eyes. It looks like this lady has dark eyes. She has uh, dark hair and blue eyes and um, is otherwise described a lot like this lady. However, this lady on the cover has, uh, she's very fashionable for the time of the printing, and the novel is set in old Rome, around the time of Nero. So, that's a little confusing. Anachronistic, that's the phrase I was looking for. Okay, so we've got pages and pages and pages of small print like this, except... When it comes to the very end, and the last few pages are inexplicably in small print like this. I don't know, maybe they had a limit on the amount of pages that they could print, a paper shortage or something. In any case, uh, that's why it took me a long time, but it is, again, a very engrossing read. It's very well written. Quo Vadis was written by Henrik Sinkiewicz who lived from 1846 through 1916. He was a Polish writer born into a noble family. He was born in the town of that, which was owned by his maternal grandmother. But his family wound up moving several times. They experienced hard times financially, and although he received poor school grades in most things except the humanities, he wound up taking various tutoring jobs in order to get himself through college and beyond. During his later years in college and afterwards, his writing started to take off. He began journalistic pieces. His columns and newspapers became popular first, and then his serialized fiction. In his late 20s, he traveled to the United States and sent back travel essays. The 1880s began the serialized novels. He married and had two children, but his wife Maria died four years after the marriage of tuberculosis. He married again roughly 10 years later, but the marriage ended two weeks after his wife left him, and he said it was due to the meddling of in-laws and had the marriage annulled. In 1904, he married his niece. Eh. In 1905, he received the Nobel Prize in Literature. This was for his various writings, his contribution to the field of epic literature. It was not just for the novel Quo Vadis, although many people think it was. He did utilize his money and fame to advance Polish causes, starvation relief, and a tuberculosis sanatorium. Because his first wife died of tuberculosis, he funded several causes in that respect. 
He was popular in Poland especially uh, for, again, the various writings named, but also his serialized trilogy with Fire and Sword, The Deluge, and Sir Michael. Now, Quo Vadis was serialized from March 1895 through March 1896, and the book form appeared later that year, becoming an international bestseller the next year. He believed that novels should strengthen and ennoble life rather than undermining and debasing it. This view pervades much of Quo Vadis, which is not only an undeniably heavily pro-Christianity novel, hence its popularity in the West, but it's an allegory for the Polish spirit. As said, the novel was incredibly popular throughout the Western world. It was the bestseller in France of 1900. Horses in a Grand Prix de Paris event were named for its characters. Okay, so Quo Vadis, the plot. First, the time. Well, I didn't get the exact year but it's set at the end of Emperor Nero's rule, so ancient Rome. You know the whole story of Nero playing while Rome burned, playing a fiddle or whatever, it probably wasn't actually a fiddle in the book, it's a lute. Anyway, um, that is not when Rome ended as an empire. I always thought it was because that was the only part of the story I knew and I'm sure I wasn't alone on that. Apparently Rome continued for a bit after and they tried rebuilding but uh, then people got pretty dissatisfied with Nero pretty quickly and things went downhill from there basically. Quo Vadis begins just before all this. Uh, Rome is on top of the world as a world power. We pick up with our hero <laughs> I'm going to mispronounce all the names because I only saw them written, um, but here goes. Vinicius, um, who is a general or something, he's a pretty high-ranking soldier in the army, Fort Nero. He has an uncle, Petronius, who is called the Arbiter of Elegance. He is really high-ranked in Nero's favorites, his, you know, his close cabinet of yes-men, basically because Nero is most definitely a tyrant. He is not a benevolent ruler. He doesn't think of his subjects as people, or really most anyone else as people. He's mostly concerned about himself. The focus, however, is not on Nero. He is not the star of this show. We are following Venetius to a second degree, Petronius, because he loves Venetius. Venetius is his nephew. So basically, Venetius or Venetius, it's, it's one of the two. I'm sorry, this is bugging me. I'm just saying Venetius and going with it. Venetius has spotted this hot chick at a uh, friend's house, a friend of Petronius and all of them, well-known personage named Aldous. Lygia is how I'm pronouncing her name. They call her that, it's not her actual name, but they call her that because she was a high-ranking princess of the Lygians, who are a barbaric race, they're described as that, who have been conquered by the Romans. She was taken as a hostage and given to Aulus and his wife Pomponia to look after, and basically her people could have gotten her out of there, but they have forgotten her. So now she is being raised by Aldous and Pomponia as their own daughter, and they are very kind to her, and she's pretty happy, actually. Now, this is what we call historical fiction, because they're, the events certainly happened, if not exactly as they're told, and a lot of the characters were, in fact, real people, not just Nero, but Aldous, Pomponia, uh, Petronius was a real person. So that's what we're dealing with here. In any case, moving on. So Venetia sees Lygia. He's got the hots for her instantly. He's like, I must have this woman. Like many of the other high-ranking people in Rome, along with Nero, he kind of doesn't see her as a person. He's like, I see, I want, I take, I get. And that's his whole stance. He tries it. It doesn't go well. He goes to Petronius to intervene with Nero, saying, hey, my nephew wants this chick to marry her. And Nero's like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. So they arrange for Lygia to be taken 
from this house where she's lived most of her life, really. It's the only home she's ever known. She gets taken to Nero's palace and from there sent to Venetius' house. However, Lygia is a Christian, which is not a huge faith in Rome. A lot of Romans do not understand what the faith is all about. And there's a lot of stories floating around out there like, oh, they're blood drinkers and child killers and etc. So anyway, Lygia confides in Octea. Octea is a lady in Nero's court who used to be his girl and still loves him, but he's kind of pushed her to the side uh, because she is a really nice person and still gets along with everybody. She's allowed to stay in the court instead of just being kicked out. Anyway, she takes charge of Lygia. She is also more or less a Christian and she helps to get the word out. So when Lygia is sent to Venetius's house, the Christians come and ambush the litter where she is being carried. They take her away. Venetius then works on tracking her down, like a dog with a bone, this one. He finds her. He tries carrying her off again. <laughs> now, Lygia's, uh, Lygia has a companion, Ursus. He is one of these uh, guys who's depicted as a big, strong dude, not that smart and incredibly loyal to Lygia. So, uh, <laughs> kind of like a dog, one might say. You know, one of those not entirely... Um, complimentary depictions. He is depicted as a very good guy, though. So Ursus uh, beats Venetius to within an inch of his life and is ready to kill him when Lygia intervenes and says, no, 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 that's not what we do. So she takes charge. They nurse Venetius back to health. And at first, he doesn't know what's going on. Why are these people being so nice to me? Then little by little, he learns more about the Christian faith and what they stand for. This novel also has the apostles Peter and Paul in it. They show up in Rome, having been dictated by Christ or God, um, both if you will, um, to spread the word in Rome. I am putting in a lot of detail, but long story short, Venetius ends up being converted to the Christian faith. And because of this, he and Lycia are recognized by Peter as, you know, okay, you kids can go and get married and all will be well. Venetius is baptized, so all's cool there. However, there are intrigues that get in the way because that's all the palace is about. I mean, Rome, and especially Nero's court, is depicted as, I mean, we're talking, you know, like Louis the Fourteenth, ancient Rome, um, all this debauchery and such like. There's, you know, orgies and drunkenness and people half naked, if not all naked, and which is pretty hot stuff for late 1800s, but also he's depicting all the stuff as bad. Oh, there's also divorced women. Gasp! Any hoodle Nero is, of course, uh, suspicious of anything that threatens his power, and Christianity appears to be one of those. And, of course, everybody around him follows his lead, all the yes-men. The Augustales is how I'm pronouncing it. Could be Augustales. I don't know, but that's what the dudes around him are called. So again, anyway, a long story short, uh, Nero is away on one of his many trips. He uh, sees himself as a poet and an artist and all this stuff, and everybody encourages him in this, even Petronius, who is so incredibly complimentary to his face and so incredibly uncomplimentary behind it. He is a master of it. It's really quite funny to read. Okay, sidetracked. My gosh. Nero is away on a trip, but another guy, Ty... Oh boy, I had the worst time pronouncing this. Ty Gelinus, I believe it is. Ty Gelinus, who vies with Petronius for Nero's top spot in his affections. Nero voiced at one point his boredom with everything and, oh, if he could just burn it all down and start over. And Tigellinus is like, well, I could help you burn something down. Why don't we burn this down? Why don't we burn that down? Well, through whatever events, I'm not sure it's ever made clear how it happened, but Rome does burn, of course. Well, people start saying it was Nero who did it because the word gets back that uh, he was talking about this. So in order to deflect the blame, uh, he blames it on the Christians. So the Christians are rounded up, put in jail, and um, Rome has been burned pretty much down, but they get to work right away building new Colosseums and, you know, 
amphitheaters and arenas and whatnot to put the Christians to death showily, basically. And that's exactly what they do. This part of the novel is hard to read. There are some rough descriptions of people dying in rough ways. That includes men, women, and children. So fair warning there. The people find comfort in their faith and the fact that they will be going to heaven and whatnot. So even in the arena, they're praying and looking, if not happy, then peaceful, which confuses the onlookers. Of course, Lygia is left to the last. Venetius tries all sorts of ways to get her out of prison. He can't manage it. He finally uh, gives up and says, you know, it's up to God and they're both at peace and ready for it as much as possible. Ursus is sent out into the arena and out comes a bull. He has to fight the bull. Well, strapped to the horns of the bull is Lygia. Ursus grabs the bull by the horns and just stops him in his tracks and <laughs> more violence um, manages to kill the bull and save Lygia. And the crowd is so impressed that they say mercy, mercy for everyone. And rather than go against the tide, Nero very sensibly pardons them. And they are able to leave. The tide continues to turn against Nero and all who are near him. And his entire regime goes down. Yes, it was an interesting novel. It, it kept my attention. It's, um, you know, it is written in an old-fashioned style. There's lots of these and thous, and it's the sort of thing where if it's a movie, which it is, um, they're probably speaking in British accents for some odd reason. But I don't know. I've yet to watch the movies. This has been made into a movie or series at least what, four times. There was a silent version in 1913. There was a silent version in 1924. There was the most popular to date a big Hollywood big budget version in 1951 that had Robert Taylor and Deborah Carr, big famous actors of the time. Actually, Elizabeth Taylor tried out for it but didn't get in. Then there was a mini series version, what was that, 1985 or something? Uh, 80s, definitely. And then most recently, a 2001 movie version that looks a bit low budget. But yes, that's all we have to date. I want to read just this one part. There's some good stuff in here. There are parts of this that are very allegorical. Uh, you, you read anything, you get out of it what you get out of it. Um, <laughs> well, let me just read this one part that I got something out of, and we'll see if you do too. And it struck him that a people propped up by force, by cruelty, such as even barbarians had no conception of it, mad and dissolute, could not endure. Rome dominated the world, but it was also its sore. From it was wafted a putrid odor. Over decaying life hovered the shadow of death. More than once had this been spoken of, even among the Augustals. But never before had the truth come so near home to Petronius than the garlanded chariot upon which stood the statue of Rome in the guise of a triumphator, dragging behind it a chained herd of nations, was hastening on to a precipice. The life of the world-ruling city appeared to him a sort of mad dance, an orgy which must soon come to a close. He now perceived that the Christians alone had a new foundation for life. But alas, before long not a vestige would be left of the Christians. And what then? The mad dance would continue under the lash of Nero. When Nero was gone, another would be found like him or even worse, since among such people and such patricians there was no hope for a better one. There would be a new orgy, viler and fouler than ever. But the orgy could not last forever. Sleep must terminate it, even through very exhaustion. Okay, I'm going to read one more part, and that's because this is the greatest. You've heard of a diss song, or, you know, just telling somebody off. It's, this is great. Petronius has been to Nero throughout the novel, a very careful yes man, although he is not afraid to diss him behind his back. However, facing death, he finally tells him what he thinks of him, and it is brilliant. He took a letter from under the purple cushion and read as follows. O oh, Caesar, I knew that thou anxiously awaitest my coming, and that thy loyal and friendly heart yearns for me day and night. I know that thou wouldst rain gifts upon me, make me the prefect of thy praetorian guards, and command Tigellinus to become that which for the gods created him, 
an overseer of mules and those, thy lands, which thou didst inherit by the poisoning of Domitius. Pray pardon me if now I swear to thee by Hades and by the shades of thy mother, thy wife, thy brother, and Seneca, who are all there, that I cannot go to thee. Life is a great treasure, my beloved, and from this treasure I have known how to select the most precious gems, but in life there are things which I cannot longer endure. Pray do not think that my feelings were hurt, because thou didst kill thy mother, thy wife, and thy brother, because thou didst burn Rome and send to Erebus all the honest men in thy empire. No, grandson of Kronos, death is the common doom of hu humanity, and no one could expect nothing else from thee. But to lacerate my ears for long years to come with thy singing, to see thy mountebank legs contorted in the Pyrrhon dance, to listen to thy playing, thy declamation, thy poems, O oh, wretched suburban versifier, would be too much for my strength, and has aroused in me a wish to die. Rome stops her ears to avoid hearing thee, the world laughs at thee, and I wish no longer to blush for thee, nor can I do it. The howls of Cerberus, my beloved, though they resemble thy singing, will less offend me, for I have never been his friend, and I do not need to be ashamed of him. Farewell, but sing no more. Kill, but write no poems. Poison, but dance not. Turn incendiary, but do not play upon the harp. Such are the wishes, and such the last friendly advice sent to thee by the Arbiter of Elegance. Okay, so yes, this video was a little longer than I anticipated, but that's cool. Um, so I hope you found this very interesting and stuck with it to the end. Um, I just love learning more about books and authors generally. I think I'll do another video at a future date uh, detailing the ver differences between the movie versions and the book version. That's an idea I've been kicking around for a while, so uh, look forward to that. And uh, in the meantime, I am going to go do something about this big old zit, maybe. <laughs> we'll see if I'm on camera next week. I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, you have a great week and read some interesting books. Bye.